Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome along to this OSRL equipment webinar. Um, we hope you find this enjoyable and useful. Um, my name is Rich Anderson. I've been at OSRL for 15 years. I'm currently the equipment hire technical delivery lead and in charge of the team of responders and technicians who build and deliver these packages we're going to talk about. Uh, I'll let my team introduce themselves one by one after this, and then we'll get into the presentation. Hi, uh, I'm Graham Robinson. I'm a technician and responder within the EHS team. Uh, it's my job to travel out with your packages and conduct the training, uh, the exercises and any maintenance you need. Uh, pass you on to Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Wallace. Um, I've been with the company for the last eight years. Um, the last six of them I've been with the Equipment Hire Services team, where again I've provided uh, training, maintenance and technical advice uh, um, over that period of time. I'll pass you on to the next Matt. Uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Matt Jeans. Uh, I have been in the EHS or Equipment Hire Services Department for the last year. Uh, prior to this I did seven years in response, um, so they're actually responding to all spills um, uh, if and when they occurred. Hi, I'm Dave Oland, one of the senior EHS responders. Uh, been in the company for about 30 years and been in most of the departments, but currently sitting in with EHS. Thank you, chaps. Uh, you'll hear from these guys intermittently throughout the, uh, the, the next hour. So from uh, some from case studies they've put together. <clears throat> so throughout this, uh, for the next sort of 45 minutes to an hour or so, we're going to um, talk about the different types of equipment that we can hire tier one equipment. We've got um, the complete package, equipment types, uh, including offshore, harbour, shoreline and inland, um, different vessel options. So we look at how we, um, can try and aid you with choosing the best or most suitable um, uh, offshore vessels for, for our deploying our equipment. Some that work, some that don't. We've got a case study from Graham about a vessel opportunity opportunity that he did last year. Uh, we'll talk about some bespoke packages that we've made for clients. And there's a bespoke training case study from, uh, from the end of last year. Then there's a maintenance program or maintenance only program. So if you've got your own equipment, we're gonna talk about how a maintenance program can aid you there. And then finally, we're going to we're going to talk about a, a client visit during the pandemic, another case study um, just to finish it off. So the complete package. Um, what we offer as a tier one um, hiring capability is uh, exactly that, a response capability. So you've got equipment and then you've got the training to go with it and then you've got the maintenance that we offer. So if you hired equipment from us, we, we would um, come out and deliver in initial training and then um, continuing training as you go through the, um, the the course of the hire period and we'd carry out the maintenance on that equipment too. So those three items together um, make, make sure you've got a, a, a quality response package or response capability. Go into some offshore equipment. So here's some uh, some different um, images of um, our offshore equipment that we use. All of it is containerized in DMV specified um, or specification containers, which are certified before um, being delivered. And then we can assist with uh, recertification every six months in country. Um, the pictures here you can see are the offshore containment packages. So there's booms, uh, a couple of types of boom we use. Well, we actually use three, but in this picture here, there's two different types, two different brands. Um, not a lot of difference between them. It's just some slightly finer details when operating and, and using them. Um, the uh, recovery packages as well also um, come in 10-foot DMV containers. Um, I'll show you some more pictures of them a bit further down, but these are how they're roughly positioned on vessels for the um, prime um, deployment technique that we offer. There's a third, uh, I mentioned there's a third different type of containment package that we offer, um, and this is uh, another brand. Um, uh, this is a high sprint. It comes in a DMV container as well. It's a, it's a high top container, so it's slightly different, but the the, um, the specification is exactly the same. The, um, the boom goes out as a constant inflation on deployment. Um, it, it then you can you can configure it in the same way as you would a normal conventional boom um, but the inflation is done at the other end of the boom rather than in individual chambers um, it has a non-return valve so it can't it can't deflate uh, once it's inflated and once it's in position 
uh, in, inside about 20 minutes, 250 meters can go out. So it's a really quick way of deploying it. It takes a little longer to recover, um, but when you've got a spill or an incident, the important thing is to get the thing out faster than it is to recover it. Um, just before we carry on, I meant to mention at the start of this, this presentation, if you've got any questions throughout, please pop them in the chat and we uh, will answer them at the end if we can. Thank you. So this offshore recovery package or the pa recovery packages that we offer, there's two different types again or two different brands. Um, essentially, they do exactly the same job. You've got um, um, some power pack, two different types of power packs um, with uh, a skimmer each with removable hose floats and a removable brush adapter. So you can have it as a weir option or as a brush adapter, depending on the product that you might be working with. Um, comes with all the ancillaries, like hydraulic hoses, um, spares uh, for, for minor repairs and running repairs, um, PPE, uh, sorbent pads and booms and all that kind of stuff, the finer stuff. Um, so it's a complete self-contained package, again, in DMV spec containers. Uh, also sticking with offshore, but on the dispersant side of things, it's some really effective um, uh, effective response strategy that a lot of our clients like to use if it's approved to use in that region. Um, this is a 10 foot container again with four cubes of, of uh, dispersant in. Um, and this particular pump in, in system is a, an AFIDO system made by AOS Fernie. AFIDO is an acronym. It stands for AOS Fernie Even Dropout. And Even Dropout is the... Um, is the, uh, the the pattern that the dispersant sprays when it comes out of the Afido nozzle. Um, it creates a nice big teardrop that you can angle and, and position to to put over the spill. Um, these can be attached to any vessel um, without exception. The only limitations you'd have is, is the limited space to put dispersant on, but the pump is very small and the, and the nozzles can attach to pretty much any side or any bulwark. Um, they do have their limitations. Uh, they're very affected by the wind. And, and obviously the limitation of getting dispersant on a really small vessel is, is going to be challenging. So you might not have the space or the weight uh, allowance for it. So if you can put these onto a, a, a PSV or, or whatever you'd be operating with, um, they'd be a good good option, but you'd want to try and get the, the uh, Afido nozzles low as low down as possible or as low angled as possible. So, you, so you, it's not affected by the wind. Um, other options, that this, this system can kind of run with. So these pumps can run spray arms as well, which is another um, another one we, we hire out. We offer this. Uh, there's a couple of clients that um, much prefer this to a feedo systems for the reasons I've stated. They don't like the, the fact they're affected by the wind. And if you're quite high up on a vessel, then they're not so effective either because the droplets, by the time they reach uh, the water's level, then they may be dispersed far, far apart with the wind. Um, so the spray arm option is, is uh, a well well known technique that works well, but you do need to do a little bit of fabrication work before um, it can be fitted or deployed to the side. Um, normally, a little bit of welding to weld like a post or gimbal on, uh, and then the the arms can can assemble together and then be placed on the side. Um, if you can uh, have the, the 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 arms in position at all times and just tucked alongside, if that's possible. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Um, if you can leave it alongside, maybe not with the drop downs on, then it, it saves a lot of time and, and prep work and getting this stuff ready if you have a spill. Um, these are really good because you've got a, quite a wide swath width you can get with them. They're not so affected by the wind because you can get the, the dispersant almost directly above the water with the long drop downs. They come in various different lengths depending on the height of your vessel. Um, so they're really good for applying that, but they're just not as quick to set up as the Afido systems and they can't go on any vessel. Um, I don't know if you notice on the left, there's a, a, a little nozzle on the end of one of the arms and that's called a wing jet nozzle. And it gives you about another uh, 1.5 to 2 meters extra swath width if you want to add that nozzle on as well to get a bit more. So uh, a few options we can look at there when spraying dispersant. So vessel selection. So now I'm going to talk about, like I mentioned at the start, about the types of vessels that um, would be ideal and, and not so ideal for, for deploying our equipment from and positioning our equipment. Um, so this picture, that we've just picked some random vessels. This is, looks like it's got a deck crane. It looks like it's got a, an open roller stern, um, deck space for storage. Um, and I reckon this this would be a preferable or, or um, suitable for OSR operations because you've got a nice good working area, a crane and, and the other things I've mentioned. So this would be a, a thumbs up if you, if you could get this option. 
<clears throat> a closed low stern on this one. It's it, it's a lot smaller, um, a very small work deck. It looks like it's got a, a, a low um, uh, stern as well as like some some ironwork along the side. So you'd have to bear that in mind. You can make this work, and as uh, Graham's going to explain in a case study a bit later on, um, you make it work, but it, it would be a bit more challenging, and you have to think about it a little bit more. Not preferred, but you could definitely do it. This one uh, looks pretty suitable. It's got a closed low stern, so you could probably deploy over the back of that. However, it doesn't look in the center of that stern. You've got a couple of bollards which might get in the way and hamper any kind of boom deployment. Um, it looks like it's got a crane, but I can't 100% make that out. It might just be the uh, the vessel vessel crane. Um, again, workable, but not preferred. Um, this one looks like it's got a, a closed low stand again. Um, very small deck space. I don't think it's got cranes. I think they are the, the vessel launching cranes. So I don't think that'd be suitable for use um, for deploying uh, skimmers and such. You could probably make it work for deploying boom, but you'd have to think about it seriously and, and get some decent plans in place. So this one looks really good. It's got an open middle stern, um, which is great. Uh, good size deck space. Although on that picture there, it's got um, uh, it looks like the deck's full of containers and stuff like that. Um, it's uh, this will be very suitable for OSO operations, providing that was all cleared and you've got you know the stuff you need in place. Uh, this one is, looks like it's got semi uh, open middle stern. I, I don't know if those bollards. They might drop down. It doesn't look like they do, but they might do. So it's, it's some questions we could ask. Um, if they weren't there, it'd be really suitable for, for OSL operations because it's got cranes. It's got um, uh, big open deck space to position the containers nicely. <clears throat> this one has got a closed high stand by the looks of it. I can't see the exact height, but it looks pretty high. Um, it's got a small clear deck space. So although it looks like it might be suitable for putting containers on, it wouldn't be very suitable for deploying from um, it, it just it, it'd be a bit too awkward to do a bit too dangerous to deploy over over the height of the, that stern we have had a request before uh, about deploying over I think it was a three meter um, closed stern and we said we couldn't um, so they actually cut a hole in the stern um, which was workable in the end but it was a lot of work up for um, you know deploying deploying the boom Right, so now, as I said, Graham's going to talk about a vessel opportunity that he did uh, tail end of last year or last summer, I think it was. Um, so I'll hand you over to Graham. Yeah, so like Rich mentioned, uh, one of the biggest challenges we come across sometimes in equipment hire is working with vessels of, vessels of opportunity. So you never really know what to expect when you go into country and the operators don't necessarily have the spill response at the top of the list when they're selecting their vessels. So you're unlikely to get a perfect vessel and it means that sometimes we've got to change our approach quite often to suit, suit what we're presented with. So I'm just going to talk about a, a client visit I did at the back back at the beginning of 2020. Uh, it was done in partnership with uh, a North Sea operator, uh, the Scottish Fishing Federation and the Coast Guard. Um, so what we've done was we hired a package which contained uh, offshore containment recovery a dispersant spray set and a dispersant sampling kit. And basically the aim of the exercise was to make sure that it was to make use of the, the resources available in the UK and prove that fishing vessels could be safely and successfully de uh, deploy the oil spill equipment if called upon. Uh, so fishing boats are already used quite regularly as guard vessels in the North Sea. So it sort of makes sense to, to train the crews up in spill response and then that resource is there uh, and available if it's ever needed. So uh, arrived in Fraserburgh on the morning of the exercise to meet the two fishing vessels and uh, straight away you could see that there was going to be a few challenges to overcome. That's the, the two vessels in the picture there. So as you can see from Rich's slides, not exactly the most ideal vessels for uh, a spill response. Um, so the deployment vessel at the bottom, which is the one that, that uh, puts the boom in the water, it had a, a really limited deck space. So the deck is actually enclosed at, at the stern uh, and had a small opening out to water. So you had really poor visibility. You didn't have as much space to store the equipment and you had a real problem in loading the equipment on. Uh, There's also quite a high drop off into the water, which made it even more challenging, especially in the recovery. 
so we had to make a few changes before we uh, went out to do the exercise. So instead of loading the, the boom rail onto the vessel, what we actually did was carry out a, a reel to reel transfer. So we took the, the, the boom from our reel and put it straight onto the fishing vessels reel but the, that they would um, normally shoot their nets from. So obviously straight away we saved space and they had that sort of familiarity with their own equipment and so sort I of felt more comfortable with uh, deploying. Um, normally we'd load a air fan onto the vessel, uh, but because of the weight of it, we couldn't safely transfer it through the window at the back. So what we were able to do was connect our, uh, our hoses into the ship's compressor so we could uh, inflate the boom directly from the vessel. And again, there's that familiarity and the uh, reduction in, in equipment space. Uh, we then decided that the, the second vessel would be much better to actually carry out the recovery. Uh, as you can see from the picture, there's a bit more open deck space and the crane coverage was actually a lot better. So what you would normally do is a deploying vessel, we'd bring the boom alongside and that would be where you would uh, make your collection. But in this instance, we, we switched to tactics just to make it more suitable for the vessels we had. Um, so once we had all the equipment loaded uh, and the plan in place, everyone had a, had a safety brief to make sure everyone was happy. Obviously, the, the fishermen hadn't deployed this sort of equipment before, so we wanted to make sure that everyone was was going to be safe and happy with what they were doing. Uh, went over the operational brief and, and how we were going to do it. Uh, and once we got out, the, the deployment turned out to be a really big success. Uh, the crews were brilliant and like I say, they, with the similarities between shooting their, their fishing nets and deploying the boom, um, they took to it really well. Um, we got the boom into a full J formation and got the weir skimmer in the water to simulate a, a recovery. And then we set up the Afido spray nozzles at either side and simulated a, a spraying operation as well. So, so everyone played their part in making it safe and it ran really smoothly. Uh, the teamwork and communication was brilliant despite the, uh, the challenges. Um, do you want to pop on the next slide? And yeah, I, th I think it showed that you, we can work under difficult circumstances and we can work with you to create a bespoke, spa, a bespoke package to suit your needs. Um, the key to it being successful was being able to adapt and use the experience we've got in the team to, to overcome the obstacles. And it means that you might not have the availability of the perfect vessel, but that doesn't mean that it can't be made suitable for your tier one equipment. So like I said, we can work with you and make sure that you are response ready and fully capable with, with what you have. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. So we're going to talk about harbour equipment now. Uh, it's another type of package that we've developed over the years. Uh, again, it, it containerized um, to, to kind of uniform with the rest of our packages. Um, so we've we used to a while ago put the the, the fence boom in uh, loose in, in 25 meter sections, but we we found that it wasn't very efficient to deploy. So we developed um, a twin reel. Um, that we can get 75 meters of boom on each each reel, so 150 in total. Um, it's a manual reel, but it's it's really easy to deploy and, and recover with a couple of people. Um, it's it's kind of transformed our um, our harbour packages no end, and, and we've had feedback to reflect that. Uh, it comes with a little oleophilic um, brush or disc skimmer um, with a, a spate type pump um, for recovering. Um, 10,000 litre temporary storage option in, in the form of a fast tank. Um, multiple um, options of absorbent boom and pads um, comes with PPE, so it's all self-contained again. Can be positioned at any place in the harbour that you want uh, that can be easily deployed uh, and, and recovered at the same time. Same time. <coughs> right, shoreline and inland equipment. <coughs> Um, again, we've developed these over the years, uh, basically based on what the client have, have, has requested. Um, they never used to be trailized, they used to be mainly containerized and take bits out here and there, but we've you know, developed the horse box type trailer um, that we've, we've, you can see in the pictures here, tend to come with about 200 meters of fence boom. That can alter slightly depending on the requirements, you might want a little bit more, um, but weight wise, we, about 200 is safe to get in these trailers. Um, again, comes with an oleophilic disc or brush skimmer um, with, with a similar spate type pump. Um, PPE, self-contained, uh, it's got all the blowers, um, hydraulic hoses and discharge hoses and suction hoses. Um, I mentioned the boom, it comes with 50 metres of shore ceiling boom and 150 metres of 
uh, uh, curtain boom as a standard, but again, we can we can tweak that slightly. Um, these can be pulled into position most places that um, we, we we tend to work. So you can leave them in a, a, a location, or you can strategically position them and then uh, operate from there, uh, turn them into place with a, a three and a half ton size vehicle. Um, we do two different tow options on tow tow. Uh, connection options on these so we get the NATO fitting or a ball hitch so that tends to cover most of the the ones we find around the world um, we talk about the bespoke packages now so the bespoke packages have been developed exactly as, as they state um, can, clients have, have requested some, some weird and wonderful things over the time and most of the time we've been able to um, fulfill their needs um, the first one we, we developed more about five or six years ago. This was the command trailer. We'd not done one before. We'd had a few comms here and there, uh, comms equipment here and there, but we kind of put it together in a trailer with a temporary um, shelter, which can be is deployed really quickly. Um, it doesn't have poles. It has um, high pressure inflation hoses, so that holds the structure up. It can be heated or cooled, so it can be used in most climates uh, or varying wide temperature ranges. Again, in the trailer, you can position it wherever you like. You can keep it in a central location and then mobilise it to where you need it. It comes with um, any kind of VHF equipment you, you could think of, um, gas monitors. Uh, we, we've done it with BGANs before and, and, and mobile um, command uh, equipment like that. Um, extension leads, all sorts of power. There's a generator in there, so you are all self-contained. Um, also comes with a little decon bund as well, so if you want to put uh, to keep it clean, so you can wash, you know, before your, your zonal area. So that it's we try to think of everything, but again, because it's bespoke, you can you can add whatever within reason you like that can fit in the trailer. <clears throat> We've also done um, bespoke vehicles for some clients. Um, some have wanted these little ATV, UTV type things for um, accessing harder to reach areas with normal vehicles. So um, it can come be towed on this trailer or you can also tow that trailer if you want to use that UTV um, as a small tow vehicle to carry some light equipment to different locations, get it on beaches and such so that vehicles couldn't. Um, the little vessels, um, the ribs and stuff we provide as well are also really handy for deploying shallow waters and, and accessing creeks and, and bays that might not be accessible by land. We've done some bespoke harbour packages. This was a really um, really good one we did so the client wanted um uh 300 meters of, of fence boom um twice so we wanted two lots of this or they wanted two lots of this um again so we made we got these bespoke rules made up that are slightly bigger than the ones you see in the 10 foot containers because the boom is slightly bigger it's 900 mil instead of 750 in height on the draft um so we, we've got these made up for fast deployment uh, in a harbor um again you can position them strategically around this harbor the, the harbor that we, we had work for um, uh, deploy as much or as little of that boom as you want um, self-contained again it's got it's got all the stuff you need to, to run a harbour operation um, all the rope uh, running moorings tripping boys anchors and such so um, yeah a good good package that we've um, we're pretty proud of these are some containerized shoreline packages so there's a particular client that wanted 500 meters of fence boom per package which just wouldn't fit in a trailer. You just wouldn't you wouldn't get the weight limitations to, to cover that in a trailer that you could tow behind a normal vehicle. So we had to think a little bit about how, how we could do this. And we got four 20 foot containers and we, we kitted them out all exactly the same. Um, so they got four temporary storage tanks of 10,000 litres each. They got three blowers for blowing up the, um, the, the sections of boom, the 500 sections of boom or 500 metres worth of boom they've got in. They've got a small oleophilic brush and disc a skimmer with spate type pump as well multiple anchors to, to couple that with um, we put uh, a little workbench in there for doing um, minor running repairs with a little vice on it um, it's got PPE different PPE um, per container you can see we color coded the boxes to try and if they were close together you know which box went to which container um, and we put a little sack truck in there for manual handling to move the boom about and just make it a little bit easier for getting it around beaches in different locations so Another good package um, also came with a lot of absorbent boom. Um, really pleased with that uh, and how we managed to fulfill the client's needs in quite a lot of boom. It's, it's more than we normally get asked for in 2000 meters worth of boom. So it was a good one to do. <coughs> um, we provide uh, tracking boys, um, which 
do exactly what they say they, they do. Um, we've provided them quite a few times to different clients all over the place. Um, we do sampling, uh, oil sampling test kits. So you can take samples of oil of a spilt product if, you, uh, if you're questioning whether it's actually your product or not. You can um, take a sample and get it sent away for analysis. We also do dispersant efficacy testing, which is um, uh, to test if you've got your own stockpile of dispersant, is to test whether um, if it's been in there for 10, 15, 20 years, which some clients it has, it's never been used. They've asked, is it still going to be um, efficient and effective? And um, and we can take samples of that and we can send it away for analysis and get that checked for you. And a lot of the clients that have stored it correctly in the right temperatures, it's not too hot, not too cold. Um, it, we've had dispersant that's been 20 years old that has dropped to 88 percent effectiveness so um it's yeah it's worth doing worth checking um we also do effectiveness kits so, so this is uh will dispersant work with the particular product you've got so we provide a um uh, a pellicase type um uh kit like the, like the ones you can see here but these have got little files of um different types of dispersant in so you can take a sample of the product that's been spilt put it in a bottle with some of the dispersant and do a shake test and see if it actually works and then make a decision providing it's approved to use the, the most um, effective dispersant in that region or on that oil. So I'm going to hand over now to Matt and Matt who are going to talk about some bespoke training they did um, tail end of last year again. Okay good afternoon everyone um, if you just move to the next slide. So typically, obviously, we would be traveling to your sites um, to conduct equipment maintenance and training on on average, probably six to 12 monthly basis. And obviously in that time, we can uh, provide the maintenance on the equipment that's on hire. We can provide training and familiarization for the use of the operators that would be using the equipment and you know, certain levels of exercises as well with the vessel crews or with um, the shoreline crews or you know, your, your response staff. Um, but obviously due to the global um, pandemic, actually our ability to travel is obviously severely restricted. And in most cases, we actually haven't been able to travel over the last year um, on, as you, I'm on, on a minor few occasions, which um, my colleague Dave Olin would go into. Um, so you know, conducting maintenance and training obviously has been a lot more difficult. The maintenance we obviously were not been able to um, to get to, but the training obviously we, the, the training aspects we can still look at um, as much as we can because where we can't be with the teams and do the practical on hand training we can provide um, uh, remote training so that way we can provide you with as much knowledge that we have to be you able know, to give to your vessel crews and, and your response staff so that we can still maintain uh, sort of the contact with the the all spill response equipment so that we're still familiar with that equipment if a uh, yeah, response happens and I mean bear in mind we are a global company so if you do have questions or you need support, we are available 24 hours a day. We have bases throughout the world, so we can operate 24 hours. So we have UK and we have Bahrain and we have Singapore and the US, so we can cover most regions. So if you do have questions on equipment or you need support, then we are available to you know, take those calls and, and um, advise you as best we can. And obviously, alternatively, we can provide remote support by conducting online training sessions and Whilst these, I say, aren't the, a direct replacement for practical training and being on hands and and delivering those deployments um, at the moment, obviously, it's the best we can do in the current situation. And in October of last year, we um, conducted some remote training for a client in Taiwan and they were operating on a very short window. So it was, it was quite a short term hire contract. And because of COVID, obviously, we weren't able to go to Taiwan to provide the practical training that the vessel crews needed to deploy that equipment and so what we did is we just delivered a, a remote online training session so we delivered presentations to the vessel crews and um, we, we were able to give them videos and technical diagrams just to try and impart some of our knowledge and help them to understand how to deploy that equipment um, we actually did encourage them to go and look at the equipment um, after the training so that they could just familiarize themselves with the um, with the online content that, that we'd given them um and because obviously we were only able to do it remotely you can face some problems with um like uh, connectivity and languages and typically if we were in country we could 
um, sort of liaise with someone maybe who has some sort of some better language or some English speaking skills, or even just to um, try and show the equipment. So by being sort of on the practical side, so delivering it that way. Um, but obviously because of COVID, obviously we did um, these remote um, training sessions and obviously you know, they were fairly successful and the crews are very happy. But obviously whilst we can't travel at the moment, we can provide this training remotely. So if you do need support, um, whether it be equipment or maintenance or, or any other aspect, we can provide the training that you need so that we can try and continue with that um, that familiarity with your equipment that you've got on hire. Um, obviously, one of the things is when you do deliver remotely, it, there are challenges that you need to face. And my colleague Matt is just going to go through some of the lessons learned we had from um, the training session we delivered um, for Taiwan, and he's just going to describe some of the sort of the problems we faced and how we sort of how we came about fixing them. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, we after every client visit, we always review um, the training, the maintenance, see if there's things we can do better or things that didn't go quite quite to plan or things that worked really well. So I'll just go through some of the ones we discovered on on our remote training this time. So obviously we're not seeing the working areas um, like Rick's uh, discussed earlier with the vessels or the side of a harbour. Um, I feel we overcome this with the help of the client. We use things like photos, um, Google images, um, we use deck plans and we worked well with the client to discuss where the best places for them to put the containers were. Um, and it worked out really well. They showed us afterwards where they were and it, it, it run really smoothly. So I think as long as we have good com communication between us and the client, everything's fine. Um, Obviously, technology, we all have issues no matter where in the world we are. Uh, things like bandwidth issues. Um, a bit of planning went into this one to make sure that the crew were in an area where they all had decent bandwidth um, and it, it worked well. But something we need to look on afterwards was what happens if it doesn't work so well. Um, so we looked at maybe if the videos weren't streaming properly, we could send them uh, before the training or um, send them in a, a, a slight package afterwards so they could review um, certain aspects of the training themselves. Um, in Being not able to interact face to face has, also has its challenges. Obviously, as Matt discussed before, language barriers. So we can work with the translator in country if we can have one. Um, doing it remotely made it slightly more difficult to make sure if the information is being understood, but during the training session, we had plenty of questions. It seemed to have um, really gone well with the with the crew we were training, um, and they really got involved, which was great to see. Um, the other aspect is obviously not being able to train with the, the actual equipment. Um, it has its challenges because if we were there, we have we'd be able to run through and then run through again and show the little little tricks and little bits we need to check. But, you know, we overcome that by showing videos and other training material of what needs to be checked. Um, the flexibility of online training was, it was a bit of an eye opener for us because we realised that we could be a lot more flexible with the client. So if if times change due to operational needs, we we're able to work around that um, and change our timings of when we were going to um, uh, conduct the training and obviously there was no need to change flights and stuff like that etc so in that respect it worked really well um, we were also able if we if we needed to train multiple crews at once or we could have spread the training out over uh, multiple days or weeks um, and then provide maybe videos of the training for the guys that couldn't actually attend um, we still, as Matt touched on, we still encourage all the participants to go and have a look at the equipment after the training and made it very clear that if it is there ever any questions that we were here, we were, you know, we've got email addresses, bits of that. So we were able to um, answer any questions if they if they need them. Um, in conclusion, obviously nothing beats um, training face to face, but this is a great alternative tool for maybe filling in with familiarization training or if a crew was was missed during our, our visits, this would be a great tool to pick uh, pick up on them, their missed areas. 
Um, so that's that's it. I'll hand back over to Rich. Thank you very much. Thanks, chat. Much appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, the maintenance only program. So if you've got your own equipment in country, um, it might be uh, it might have been there a while. It might not have been deployed very regularly. It might have been um, not maintained for a number of years. So you might have some some concerns about if it was needed to uh, to get it. Um, to get it up to speed. So what we can do is we can come out and do some sort of audit well, when, when travel permits, do an audit on the equipment, um, um, report back and then carry out some maintenance to make sure it's up to speed and also couple that with some training. And this goes back to that triangle I was talking about earlier. So having the equipment, whether it be yours or ours, maintenance and training together, it gives you that response capability. Take one of those away and, and that response capability is kind of compromised. So um, it's really important um, how you know that we can we we conduct this and you keep those three elements together. <clears throat> so on a maintenance program, uh, roughly, I mean, it's not exact, but I mean, we do something like this on a weekly basis. You'd kind of do like a security check of the equipment, make sure it's accessible and it's there. Um, briefly inspect the equipment and the, and the storage area, make sure there's nothing blocking it. So if you did need it in an, in an emergency, you could get to it. Uh, we've had a lot of occasions where clients have had their own equipment and have been back of a warehouse um, and they can't access it in a, you know it's taken a couple of hours to get to it by moving stuff with a forklift and stuff so if you can keep it in, a, in an area which is um, accessible at all times it makes a big difference on a monthly um, you do a, a visual check and a run-up you know check your oils before you run it but do a, um, a run-up of the equipment individually report back any issues don't just ignore them and um, quarterly you do a, a total in inventory check and run all engines and connect the equipment as a system to make sure it works because that's another problem the power pack may start but the hydraulic hoses may be um, damaged and you may not be able to run a skimmer or something like that so if you run it as a system you know um, that it's actually working uh, and again report any issues back and rectify them as needed annually um, check or change fuel uh, oil and filters if required and the reason to say if, if required is we a few years ago went through um, uh, a little bit of a, a change in in how we uh, changed our oils out so we were doing them every 24 months regardless of their condition but we bought a little testing kit to test the quality of the oil and that, you know environmentally it saved us a lot and, and so did it did um, in the pocket as well because we weren't spending as much money on wasting oil that hadn't been used or changing oil that hadn't been used so um, it was quite a worthwhile exercise doing that um, and also obviously run that up as a all equipment as a full deployment and you can couple this with some training like the guys have mentioned, uh, you know, we try to come out every six months to do to um, training and maintenance visits when when we can. Um, but obviously, at the moment, it's been a bit challenging. Uh, Dave Olin now is going to talk a little bit about a, um, a a trip he did during the pandemic. So over to you, Dave. Thanks, Rich. OK, so good afternoon. Um, back in September last year, during COVID, OSRL was requested to carry out some oil spill tier one training and some oil spill contingency plan desktop training in Suriname in South America. We'd already shipped out seven containers to Suriname three or four months previous, so it was already there. Graham and I were asked to go out and really we wanted to try and prove two things. One, that we could actually respond, and two, prove that we were actually willing to travel during the pandemic. So obviously lots of forms uh, to complete to get visas, rig entry, prove, you know, COVID, complete our 48 hour COVID test, and then flew out um, on a flight to, to Suriname. And I'd just like to thank all those in the various departments at OSRL and the host company actually for making the trip possible. So we spent good eight days quarantined in Paramaribo um, before flying out to the rig and then transferring across to the supply boats. At this stage, we had to both provide two clear swabs before they'd allow us on board uh, the rig for obvious reasons. So fortunately, we were now isolated and on the rig so we could concentrate on a checking and testing all the equipment, conducting theoretical training to the crews and also deploying the equipment into the sea 
including the spray gear with the Afido nozzles. I think you can see that all on the slides. After about six days of the same vessel, we transferred back to the rig and then back across to another vessel to repeat the same amount of training. So both crews were now fully trained. And finally, 10 days later, flew back to Parbo. The final assignment was to conduct some theoretical training uh, on the contingency plan uh, with the shore-based management team. This then ensured that both seaside and shoreside were now all trained and ready for their drilling project. And finally, three weeks later, we could fly home and start our quarantine period again as the UK went back into its second lockdown. So main lessons learned really was to prove that trips to clients' premises is possible and only if it's allowed, but much more planning is obviously needed than before. And obviously to factor in more time for training, because obviously practical exercises are taking that much longer. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dave. And that pretty much concludes the uh, the webinar. Um, uh, I'll come out of this screen a minute and see if there's any questions in the chat. We've got uh, our email addresses for contact out there if you want to ask us any questions out of this webinar. Um, but yeah, other than that, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I'll go to the chat. I'm struggling to see that any that haven't been answered at the moment, actually. So I guess that's that's a good sign. We do have one that I've caught here. Where is your base in Africa for bespoke equipment? Someone's asking. Uh, OK, um, well, we don't have a, a, a base as such in, in Africa. Um, what kind of bespoke equipment? We, we can take this offline, but I mean, what kind of bespoke equipment were you after? I suppose that would be there if you're still there. Um, this one question, this can be quite unnerving for skippers who are new to this type of operation. I think he was talking to the vessel um, when you're referring to the vessels deploying OSR, yeah. OSR kit. How do you best approach working with individual skippers ahead of a deployment to ensure they're comfortable and that the deployment is safe? OK, so we, we can I can answer that briefly now, but um, if you want to email me as well afterwards, we can talk about that. It's no problem. But um, Basically, we go through before we do any kind of um, uh, wet run, as it were, we go through the deployment, we go through the training, the skipper will get the um, theory training that we offer for deploying booms. So they 100% understand what we're going through, what we're going to be doing step by step. We've got the operational working instructions that we um, go through as well, step by step with the skipper. So the skipper and his crew are fully aware of exactly what we need to do. And we do it slow time in training. And if there's any questions or queries that come out, we stop the operations uh, and, you know, answer those questions and then go again. That's the, the safest way of doing it. Um, and then we have a question, a regional specific question. Thanks. Do you have um, any response equipment in said region? I think uh, they're, they're dialing in from Libreville. So there are tier one response team stations in Libreville, Gabon, Gabon. Um, and be interested to know where and which equipment can be found in the event of an incident in that, in that region. OK, thanks for the question. So <clears throat> um, we don't have any um, equipment located permanently in Gabon. We have had clients in Gabon that um, hire equipment from us. Um, I know there's some response equipment by some of the operators in, in uh, Libreville and Port Gentil as well, um, but we don't actually store any there. So it would, it would come from the UK. And I think, is that about it? I think that's it. That hasn't been answered, actually. If anyone had any other questions, I'll just pop um, uh, an email address in there that you can get in touch with Rich. Um, yeah. Take it offline and he can he can answer you as best he can. 
The webinar will be available recorded if you'd like to watch it afterwards or share it with your colleagues. It'll be on our technical library on our website. I'll send a link to that through as well just now and um, you'll be sent a link via uh, email as well. Thank you very much everyone. Thanks everyone. Have a nice day.